Have you ever wondered what the gun is on the original IDPA logo? Well, I can tell you, it's a Beretta 92. More specifically, it is Ken Hackathorn's Ernest Langdon customized Beretta 92 FS. Even more specifically, it is this gun, which now belongs to me. In this video, we are going to go through the features of this gun, which is a very early custom Ernest Langdon Beretta 92 FS. And then we are also going to compare its features to a much more recent gun by LTT, which was done up for me just last year, 2020. And we will see how these two guns from very different eras compare to each other. I think that's going to be really interesting. But first, 10 seconds of your time. I have a Patreon page. I post multiple new things there every week. $5 a month. I'll make it worth your time. And it gives me enough money to buy more guns to bring videos like this to you. And now, back to our regularly scheduled video. Okay, so how did I wind up with this gun? Well, I was talking to Ken on the phone and Ken made the comment, you know, lately I've been selling a lot of guns. And by the way, Ken has got some really cool guns. <laughs> and uh, Ken said, you know, people have been calling me up on the phone and they've been saying, hey, I've heard that you're getting rid of a lot of guns. Are you ill? Are you dying? Because that's the only reason they could think of that a guy like Ken would be selling a lot of guns. And Ken goes, no, no, I just have this attitude that we can't really own guns. We're just the caretakers of them. And my wife is not into guns. You know, I'm getting to a certain age and I don't want her to have to deal with this when I'm gone. So I'll get rid of these guns while I can still do it myself and I can make sure that the guns are going to good homes to people who can really appreciate them. But I'm getting, you know, phone calls from a lot of people who are going, well, Ken, you know, I'd really like to have a gun that belonged to you. So the conversation goes on for, you know, another hour <laughs> and eventually the topic comes up of what is the gun on the original IDPA logo and I said I always assumed it was a CZ 75 and Ken goes no actually it's a Breda 92 um, specifically it's actually my Ernie Langdon custom Beretta 92 FS you know the IDPA founders were sitting there one day and were trying to figure out what the gun should be on the IDPA logo. And the original thought was that it should be a 1911 because that really is the gun, you know, that the entire sport of combat pistol match shooting was built on. And I said to Bill Wilson, you know, Bill, if you put a 1911 on the IDPA logo, people are just going to say, IDPA is just a way for you to sell more of your custom 1911s. And Bill said, well, you know, what gun do you think it should be? And I said, I think it should be a Beretta 92. At the time, that was the United States Army's service pistol. And it was a gun that all the IDPA founders liked. You know, we all owned them. We all had a high regard for the Beretta 92. We could all shoot it really well. So that was actually the gun that the IDPA founder shot when IDPA started up because we wanted to make the point you don't need some multi-thousand dollar, you know, super expensive custom 1911 to shoot IDPA. So I happen to have my Ernest Langdon custom, you know, Beretta 92 with me. So I grabbed the gun out of my shooting bag and we took a photo of it and that became the basis for the gun on the original IDPA logo. Now, they changed the overall shape of the gun a little bit, you know, to make it more, you know, like a generic gun instead of identifiably 
a Beretta 92, but yeah, yeah, that's the gun that the Beretta 92 logo is based on. At which point I said to him, well, you know, Ken, I'd really like to have a gun that belonged to you. And Ken kind of laughed and he said, well, I think we can make that happen. Okay, when exactly was this gun customized by Ernest Langdon? Well, we know by serial number that this gun was made in 1994. And Ken tells me he bought it in early 1995. We know that it had a photo taken of it in this condition in 1996 for it to, you know, become the basis for the gun on the original IDPA logo. So, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say 1995. Now, if someone were to say to me, well, you know, it could have been early 1996 instead, I couldn't argue, but I'm just going to say 1995-ish to have a year to give to it. Okay, I am going to review this gun as if I were writing a gun article, which means I'm going to go from front to rear, top to bottom. Let's start with the sights. Okay. Because the front sight is part of the slide bridge on a Breda 92 FS, we can't change the front sight. The rear sight. Ken said to me, you know, I was out with Wayne Novak one day, and Wayne said to me, hey, you should come back to my shop with me. I've got something to show you. It's really cool. So I said, okay. So I went over to his shop, and he showed me this new rear sight he had just developed for the Beretta 92. I mean, this was real new. I mean, th this may have been a prototype. And I looked at it and I said, wow, that's really cool. So he put one on my gun. Now, let's remember the Beretta 92 rear sights, the early ones, they had a really shallow rear notch. I mean, it was like half of what it is today. So there was a time when the Novak rear sight, which has a notch about twice as deep, was a huge product improvement. Now, both the front sight and the rear sight have tritium night sight inserts, which are long burned out, and I don't care. Not a huge night sight fan. The overall sight picture, the height and the width of the front sight, the depth and the width of the rear sight, how the overall sight picture looks is actually pretty darn good. These are nice sights. I like them. Let's talk about the finish on the gun because it actually looks really good. Um, it actually looks like the slide and the frame, especially the slide, have been blued. But no, this is actually Bruneton. Um, but the thing is, you know, we think of Bruneton these days as, you know, it, it looks kind of crappy, it looks caked on, it chips really easily, you know, it's not an attractive finish. There have been numerous formulas of Bruneton over the decades. And what they were using when this gun was made back in 1994 actually looked really good. And Ken made the comment that this finish, you know, actually looked kind of dull to start with, but the more you use the gun and the more it goes in and out of a holster, the more that it burnishes and the more it actually starts looking like bluing. Now, Beretta doesn't Bruneton their barrels. The barrel has been parkerized, which is why, you know, there's some finish wear on this gun, you know, especially on the front of the slide. It's been in and out of a holster a lot. Um, there is especially wear on the barrel, you know, because the finish is not nearly as durable as the Bruneton. But, you know, that's what happens if you carry a gun and shoot a gun. It gets wear on it. That's just the way it works. I think it looks good. 
I think the wear on this gun is just a part of its story. Now, you will notice over on the left slide flat, the lettering on the side of the gun has actually been filled in with white. That's because Ken, you know, kind of likes filling in the lettering on his guns with white grease pencil. And, you know, of course, over time it's worn a little bit, but, uh, you know, I think it still looks cool. Now, Ernest Langdon fitted this gun with the spurless hammer off of a Beretta 92D. Now, a lot of people seem to think that the reason the Beretta DAOs are DAO is because the spurless hammer doesn't have a single action cocking notch on it. And that is not true. The spurless D hammer does have a single action cocking notch. The thing is that what causes the hammer on a DASA Beretta 92 to stay to the rear when you fire the gun is there's a spring-loaded sear inside the gun. On the double action only guns, they leave those parts out. So the hammer just follows the slide forward and you get a double action trigger pull for every shot. When you apply the D hammer to a gun that does have the normal sear inside the gun, what you wind up with is a spurless hammer that stays cocked for single action after you fire the first shot. Now, safety system. The gun has the traditional Beretta 92 safety system. You push down on the safety lever decocks the gun, puts it on safe, after which the safety lever stays down. You can carry the gun on safe if you want to. If you want to carry the gun off safe, you can push the safety lever up and carry the gun off safe. Now, the magazine release button on this gun is the stock Beretta 92 round button, which honestly I have never found particularly comfortable, <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, the grips on the gun were actually given to Ken by Dave Harrington. And by the way, I will mention, um, this is the gun that Ken carried and taught with during, as he puts it, the NDA years, when I was teaching government employees, which is tactful speak for he was training Tier 1 units. Now, um, I don't know what some of those units were, but I do know this was the time period when Ken met Larry Vickers and Dave Harrington. So I think that's a clue. But anyway, Ken says, you know, he saw these grips on one of Super Dave's Beretta 92s, and he said, wow, those are really cool. So Dave gave him a set. Now, Dave is one of my Facebook friends, so I asked him, hey, did you stipple these grips yourself, or, you know, did you have someone do it for you? And Dave said, um, you know, a friend of mine had done these. I saw them on his gun. I really liked them, so I commissioned him to do some grips for me as well. I don't know who did these grips, but he did an excellent job. Um, the stippling on these grips, he did a really good job sanding it down afterwards. It gives you a great texture, but it's not rough or abusive on your hands at all. I mean, you could go out and, you know, put a thousand rounds in a day at a handgun training class through this gun, and it's not going to be a problem. Now, the grips are a little, you know, thick, as the stock Beretta 92 grips are, but they still give a great feel, and the gun points really well, actually. Now... Ernest did go in and he opened up the magwell. 
The stock Beretta 92 FS Magwell is actually really tight and really squared off. So he opened it up to make, you know, insertion of a fresh magazine during a speed load a lot easier. And that is not quite all that has been done to this gun. He also trimmed the barrel, not quite even with the end of the slide. It's, it's a little longer than the end of the slide. It's been rounded off and left in the white. Um, it looks a lot actually like a 1911 barrel. And I think it looks really good. Um, trimming the barrel on a Beretta 92 short is something that Ernest Langdon has been doing for a long time, since 1995 at least. And he thinks it looks really good and I agree. Now, you'll notice I haven't talked about the trigger pulls yet. And we're going to talk about the trigger pulls when I, we talk about how this gun differs from my much later production LTT Custom Bread 92, which is this gun. Okay? Now, to start with, the sights are different. We have got an orange dot on the front sight. We have got a Wilson rear sight. The overall configuration of the sight pictures between, you know, this gun and this gun, as far as, you know, how deep the notch is, how wide it is, um, obviously you've got the same front sight because on the Bred 92 FS the uh, the front sight's actually a part of the slide bridge so you can't change it um, but the sight picture's really close the only real difference here is that my newer gun has a highly visible orange dot on the front sight whereas this gun has a burned out tritium insert so in that sense we have to give the sight picture to this gun um, this gun is actually fitted with the G lever, which means that when you push it down to decock the gun, the safety lever doesn't stay down. It pops up again. So you can't um, carry the gun with the safety on, but you also don't have to worry about the safety being on when you didn't know it was on. Um, the grips on the gun are a set of VZ grips, which are about as thin as they can be and still have grip panels on the gun. Ernest has also opened up the magwell on this gun, and he's installed a Wilson mag guide, which really does help, actually, um, with the speed load. And... Aside from the slide in the frame on this gun, and the slide in the frame been finished in black Elite Chrome, everything on this gun has been finished in MP3, which makes the gun very easy to clean. I mean, you can wipe this gun down with a paper towel, maybe some Q-tips, and that's all it takes to clean this gun. And it has a wonderful effect on the trigger pulls. So, let's talk about the trigger pulls. I'm going to start with this gun, and then we're going to go back to the earlier gun, and we're going to talk about how they differ. Okay. Let's start by actually talking about the stock Beretta trigger action, because it's not great. What happens when you fire the stock Beretta 92 is you start pulling the trigger, and the trigger stacks as it gets further to the rear, it gets heavier, and then when the trigger is still far from the end of its travel, it suddenly lets go, it releases, and you've got you know, a lot of energy suddenly slamming to the rear. Then there's a fairly long forward movement until the trigger resets, and then you have a lot of reuptake travel. The reset and the wall, you know, where you pull the trigger the rear and it suddenly stops so you can prep the trigger are in two different places. So you've got a lot of reuptake travel. This does not lead to a gun that is terribly 
easy to shoot fast and well. Now, this gun, the new gun, the one that's only a few months old, has a new part in it that Ernest Landon calls the Optimized Performance Trigger Bar. And I will show you what this does. Okay, let's start with the double action trigger pull. By my NRA weight set, the double action trigger on this gun goes seven and a quarter pounds. And it is just oily smooth. Oh my God. Now that's seven and a quarter pounds with a D spring, the 16 pound mainspring out of a D model Beretta, which I have in the gun because I like firing this gun with hard primered foreign ammo. If I were only firing it with American ammo, I would be using something like, you know, a 13 pound spring, which Ernest does put in most of his guns. But, you know, seven and a quarter pounds, oily smooth, Oh, no stacking. It's awesome. Now, the gun cycles. Here's where the optimized performance trigger bar comes in. This is the entire reset distance on this gun. That's it. Super short. And then the reset and the wall are in the same place. So there's no reuptake treble. Buy my NRA weight set, single action trigger pull on this gun, three and three quarter pounds. Boom. Oof. Nice. So, long but slick double action. Boom. Super short reset. No reuptake travel. Boom. Single action. Awesome. Now, Let's talk about the gun that Ernest made back in 1995. Now, it is worth noting that back then, um, Ernest did not have the array of aftermarket parts that are available for the Beretta 92 now, because he has designed most of them himself in the intervening years. Um, back then, he had to customize factory parts. And I was talking to Ernest, and he actually remembers this gun. He said, you know, this was a very early custom gun of mine. I didn't do that many guns back then. And Ken has made the comment. He said, you know, Ernie, and by the way, I will mention, um, Ken Hackathorn always calls Ernest Langdon Ernie. I think because he knows that Ernest hates being called Ernie. And as Sandra Bullock observed in Demolition Man, that is how insecure heterosexual males show affection. So, Ken said, Ernie used to sit and he would work over the parts in a Beretta 92 for hours with files and stones and Dremel tools until everything was absolutely perfect. Because back then, you know, he wasn't doing this as a job. It, it was a, a passion project. You know, it was a labor of love. We might even say a hobby. <laughs> so, these are the sorts of trigger pulls that we got when Ernest Langdon had to modify factory parts and he was doing everything by hand. Okay, to start with, the trigger pulls. Still super slick. Yeah. Now, by my NRA weight set, believe it or not, these trigger pulls go nine and a half pounds, but they don't feel like nine and a half pounds. You know, it's kind of a cliche to say it's not the weight of the trigger, it's the quality, but it's really true. I mean, I have a fairly educated trigger finger. I can normally pick up on minute differences in trigger pulls, and honestly, I really can't 
tell much difference between this double action trigger and the one in the gun that Ernest did 25 years later. Now, in order to deal with the over-travel issue back then, um, Ernest actually welded a pad onto the back of the trigger and then he reshaped it and that gave him what he called the speed bump trigger. So yeah, oh, just almost nothing in the way of over-travel. Yeah, nice. Okay, the gun cycles, we go to reset the trigger. It's fairly long. Yeah, right there. Now, we do have some reuptake travel, not a lot. And then the single action goes five pounds even. But again, I mean, it doesn't feel like five pounds. It's just super slick. I mean, really, really nice. So, double action, boom. Reset, take up the slack, boom. Yeah, nice. Now, when I say that it's really hard, other than the reset, you know, the reset distance, the reuptake, um, because the optimized performance trigger bar didn't exist when Ernest made this gun, um, when I say it's hard for me to tell the difference between the trigger pulls in this gun and the trigger pulls that LTT did 25 years later, that's not an indictment of the younger gun's trigger pulls. The trigger pulls are awesome. You know, I'm just saying, you know, Ernest Langdon has not been resting on his laurels for the last 25 years. He has learned something in the intervening quarter century, and he has, you know, an array of aftermarket parts and finishes that just didn't exist back in 1995. Having said that, I will also say that even when he didn't have a lot to work with, Ernest Langdon was doing a lot with a little. This gun is really nice. <sighs> okay, this gun. I am actually going to carry this gun, and I'm going to take this gun out, and I am going to shoot matches with it. However, obviously, there's going to need to be some changes. For one thing, I'm going to have to clean all the graffiti off this box. I mean, really. Look at that. Seriously? <sighs> now, on the gun itself. I think I need an orange dot on the front sight. I need to dump this Novak prototype rear sight. I'll put a Wilson rear sight on it. Need to get rid of all this white grease paint. I'm going to have a G lever pistol smithed into the gun. Need to get myself a hammer that actually has a spur on it. I'm going to have Ernest Langdon put an optimized performance trigger bar in the gun. I need to get one of those factory Beretta flat extended magazine release buttons. Wilson Mag Guide. And I need to dump these Dave Harrington grips and get a set of VZ grips on the gun. And once I've got all that done, I think this gun will be in shape. No, wait a minute. I think I'll have the entire gun in P3. And once we've got all that done, this gun will be in shape. <laughs> Just kidding. Now, I wasn't kidding about the I'm going to carry this gun and shoot matches with it thing. But the truth is that this gun is an important historical 
artifact. It is awesome as it is set up and it is going to stay just the way it is right now. If you want to see a more in-depth review of the current LTT Beretta 92, there's a link. You can do that right here. If you want to subscribe, you can do it right here. This was fun. We should do this again sometime.